Just a quick note before we start. This entire first season of Inspired Business was recorded before the coronavirus outbreak in the UK. Hence, there being no mention of it in the interviews. Thanks. Enjoy the podcast. Hello, and welcome to Inspired Business, the business podcast from the University of Derby. During this series, we are bringing you inspiring stories from across the business landscape in Derby, Derbyshire and beyond. We discuss the issues affecting your business and provide key insights from our guests for you to take away. I'm Toby Bradford, your host for the series. I'm joined by my co-host, business expert, Angela Tooley, who will offer you valuable analysis on the topics we cover. This week, we take a dive into the entrepreneurial world and consider what large business can learn from the idea of being an entrepreneur. We'll be talking to Dean Jackson, the founder and owner of Hoop Design. Now, Angela, you know Dean. Yes, I do. What a great bloke. Uh, He's certainly very interesting, has an inspirational story to tell and and quite obviously has a, a passion not only for the business and the product that he's developed but also for the city that he he has lived in for most of his life and he's now running his business in giving something back to the city yeah and he takes us on that story on that journey from the spark of the idea to a successful company via the olympic games and how he got there is a story in itself and it's wonderful to listen to him telling it yes indeed but he also has some interesting thoughts about entrepreneurship And in fact, the word entrepreneurs itself and how that can apply to larger businesses. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? The word entrepreneur. And we've always had people who have started and run their own business. But it's a word that we is only really come into its own in the last sort of 10 years, really. We all have great ideas, but how many of us actually take those great ideas and turn them into something that's a, a financially and commercially sound business and really perhaps that's something about the definition of entrepreneur is it it is about someone who takes those risks and actually is prepared to have a punt and perhaps accept those knockbacks and bounce forward from them and Dean certainly is able to tell that story as well. Dean very much tells that story there are lots of risks and punts involved. Angela will be back later for our analysis but for now let's hear what Dean has to say. I'd like to welcome Dean Jackson to our podcast. Hello, Dean. How are you, mate? I'm very well. I'm sitting in Dean's office. There's um, a racing bike, a chopper, a bullworker, a picture of a space hopper and an evil Knievel toy on the wall. I'm feeling at home here. The, Im- the image you could have of the bullworker and the chopper, of me riding around looking like some 70s muscle-bound bike rider. Yes, that's an interesting idea. That's an interesting <laughs> idea for our uh, listeners. But... We're not here to talk about that. We're here to talk about you and your business. So tell me, what is Hoob? What is Hoob? Um, We're a company based around making products to make athletes faster. Now, that's that's been born from uh, a a world of wetsuits and triathlon that we started in. And I wanted to reinvent the wetsuit category for triathlon swimming and open water swimming. And as we come on to dry land from that water world, try to frame the business as to what our core competency is and it came down to speed so we are about making athletes faster and rewarding them for all the effort that they put into their training so the company started with an idea yeah. so it was just one idea and a desperation to pay a mortgage oh really okay yeah. but it where did that idea come from initially well it, it came from the thoughts of my head of thinking you're too stupid dean because if it was a good idea someone else would have thought about it but i've worked for several brands i was 40 and i knew my cards were up and my number was up of whatever that saying is uh, I knew my day my day was ending when the CEO of the company I was working for and I was running global sales he just said Dean I, I, th- I think it's time we parted I can't afford to pay you anymore you've taken us to number one in wetsuit world with this brand and we were based in Derby actually and I was running the Seattle office so I was commuting a lot and you know we got to a good place commuting to Seattle yeah yeah wow yeah, uh, once a month I was there for a week. So I got good air miles. You know, I was platinum status. I had a big seat. and uh, I, I, But I knew it was coming. Um, so a couple of weeks before, months before, I'd written a business plan. And uh, I thought, now's the time to do it on my own. But yeah, what's my point of difference? And I'd looked at, I'd worked in running shoes before. And I've worked for several sports brands. 
and you had shoes for runners for different foot types and different kinetic chains and all of this. I thought, why isn't there different suits for different swimmers? Uh, you look at women, they, they've got less dense muscles, they float better. And yet the neoprene thickness was the same for a women's wetsuit as the men's. So I started asking questions and I asked one of the greatest open water female swimmers ever what she liked or disliked about wetsuits. She said, oh, they're too buoyant. My bum's in the air. I need to engage with the water better. I just started thinking about, um, you know, two different buoyancies in wetsuits. And, and most swimmers in triathlon are not from a swim background. So they're dredging the bottom of the lake or the pool. So what does that mean? Explain that to me. Just sinky legs. We invented right, okay. this term, sinky legs. And when I first launched it, I got, I don't, I've got, I got my stormtrooper and the six million dollar man to show how some float really well and others don't float great. The toys. Um, you yeah, use. my toys again. So whilst they are a, a reminiscent piece of the bedroom I wish I had when I was, you know, living in Olveston at eight years old, I actually took them out on the road. The toys went on the road. It was like Toy Story does business. And just show that sinky legs is 85% of triathletes. When they swim, their legs sink. They haven't got a good engaging kick and they're just not from a swim background. And so we needed to change the buoyancy profile of wetsuits. We needed to get legs and, and hips really high in the water, decrease the frontal drag and just make the athlete go faster. And to me, I'm going, well, why has nobody done this? And, and that's where I thought, well, I must be the stupid one. You know, a wetsuit has to deliver flexibility in the upper body so you can swim and buoyancy in the lower. But everyone was putting five millimeters, which is the industry maximum for, and triathlon maximum, along the whole length of the suit. Uh, and I was just perplexed by it. So I experimented with this three five buoyancy, which was three millimeters on the upper body instead of five, and five millimeters on the lower body in, instead of five all the way through. And for women, we had three three, three upper body and three lower body, and less buoyancy because they didn't need the buoyancy. Uh, and that whole concept took off and went crazy. So it was the science, really. Yeah, to, to really strip it back, it was, let's do this through science and properly look at it. Rather than, oh, what colour should the wetsuit be? It's like Seriously, and I'd worked for three other wetsuit companies, and I'd say, oh, how do we test the suit? So, well, we, uh, we, we asked our sponsored athlete how they liked it, and they said it felt really fast, and it's 10% better than the last suit. And, and that's what their marketing message was built on, which is a load of BS. And to me, we needed to prove that this was credible. And, and the name of the company, Hoob, is it's Germanic and it means bright mind. Right. But it's also the Christian name of Professor Hoob Toussaint. And Professor Hoob is one of the leading hydrodynamicists in the world. And I, I went and met him at uh, Schiphol Airport in the train station lounge. And uh, I said, look, I've trademarked your name, but I'd like to work with you. And he says, well, you I, did that I, before I, you spoke I to did. him. <laughs> I, I leveraged his name against him. And uh, he said, well, I'd love to help you, Dean, but there's one condition. And that is, if I tell you how to make a suit better, you listen to me, you do it. I said, well, that's kind of why I'm here, because I'm the thick one and you're the smart guy and you're a professor. He said, well, I've been to several sports brands in the past. We tell them how to make a product faster and they've ignored me, which bewilders me. Why would you ignore incredible advice and guidance so we shook hands on the deal and then in the waiting room i got out all the wetsuits from all the other brands and he just started laughing and pointing and going why, why is that there what does that do what does this do and it, it was obvious that the market wasn't using science and we needed to reinvent the proposition and tell the triathletes how to go faster uh, yeah so it was it was born out of science completely brilliant now one thing that struck me looking at doing a little bit of research into you Wetsuits for triathlon, it's a very niche product. It is, yeah. Is that a leap, massive leap of faith on your part or did you really believe that there was a market out there for this? It was probably desperation and belief that I hoped there was a gap in the market because I needed to feed my four kids and send them to universities and all that kind of thing. So it, it, I could see it. Again, I thought I was a stupid one because if it was there and no one else had seen it, then why not? I did try it and it hadn't worked. And, and the, more, the more asking around, you know... It, it was like, well, we've never seen this before, so will it work? And yes, it is, a, it is a niche. But when your business has no turnover, the first year I, I turned over just short of half a million, which was huge. Now we'll, we'll do five million this year. So it makes half a million look actually quite small when you're doing that half a million now in some months. But, you know, it, it, it's, we, we know we're going to reach a ceiling and we have to move. And so, you know, the, the first ceiling was how much rubber can we put into the UK market? And then it's overseas and then the US. And then do we come onto dry land with tri suits? But if you're going to do a tri suit, which is Sorry, a tri suit, so is. a tri suit is what you wear underneath your wet suit. You do everything in it. It's you'll swim your bike and you run in it just so you don't have to stop and change. So the triathlon suit is worn underneath your wet suit. But, you know, we can all make a lycra tri suit. That's quite easy. But if you're going to do one, 
do one with a difference. So I took the same approach to the triathlon clothing, the tri suit, as I did the wetsuit. And that was, you know, pocket positioning, hydrodynamics. And now we've done a huge amount of work on aerodynamics. So again, we're making the athlete faster through no extra effort, but just through a scientific application. Now, going back to the initial idea, how long did it take from having that idea, meeting Hoob, to having something you could take to the market? It was very quick, actually, and it probably shouldn't have been that quick. I spoke to a couple of banks who weren't interested. It was 2011. And I did a triathlon in July with some friends and beat them. And I was very proud and the chest was puffed out. And then I raced them again in September and they annihilated me. And my head had gone. I'd lost my job with this previous company, Blue 70. And one of the friends I trained and raced with, he just said, what's up with you? I said, well, I've lost my job and Christmas has come in and I'm struggling a bit. And he said, well, what do you want to do? I said, I want to launch my own brand. He said, you need to speak to my mate, Tom. Okay, I haven't got a clue who Tom is. I didn't even know what my mate Mark did. You know, we just rode together and tried to beat him to the sign for the village. Uh, and it turned out Mark's a senior partner in Deloitte. And he was part of a little investment group from Nottingham called Turning Point. Uh, he rang me two weeks later and said, you know, how did it go with Tom? I said, well, I've not heard from Tom. So five minutes later, hello, I'm Tom. He's like, the mysterious Tom had rang me. Uh, and Tom Moorhood, he was just out there scouting for possible investments for Turning Point. So I met Tom, Denby Tea Rooms, towards the end of September. And within five days, I had to go and do a pitch to 12 investors from Nottingham. Now, I don't mind talking to people and you can put me in front of a thousand people and talk about wetsuits and running shoes or whatever you want. But when it's 12 individuals who've got your future in their hands, oh, it's scary as hell. They said, yes, we like you, kind of like the idea, but we like you more. And so it was 6th of October. We signed a shareholders agreement and they gave me £5,000 and said, that's the first of five. So you've got £25,000, but you need to come back with 300, we worked in dollars, $300,000 worth of orders, get an Olympian wearing one of your wetsuits and prove that your wetsuits are the fastest in the world. Well, that's quite a big challenge. It was a huge challenge. If I was asked to do it now, I'd say, you think I'm on crack, they're saying that. Me. The, the triathlon season for selling in had gone. All the shops had brought their stock, but I got straight on a plane, cheapest flight, cheapest hotel I could find, went to Hong Kong, met an old contact, and went to the factory with my drawings of the Wonder wetsuit, and they went, you can't do that. You won't be able to do that. And that's no one's done that yet. So we worked our way around it. We kept some beautiful technologies, some new stuff that I should have patented at the time. Right. But I needed to get to market. So I just rushed this through. Got my first prototypes back. What was that two, three weeks? And by the second week of December, I was out there selling. From October. It was ridiculously quick. It was crazy. It was whirlwind. And I remember walking around a store in Sussex. And I got my wheelie bag and I'd met the buyer and I, I got all my samples out. Yeah, I'm going to give you an order. And I got straight in the car and I, I, I drove down to, uh, I was going to Brighton Way. And at this point, I'm um, Christmas week and the weather was dreadful. And I'm, I'm a wheelie bag's rattling away down this cobbly road. I'm like, what the hell am I doing? What is going on? You know, I've, I've got these samples. I'm really late. I've got to hit the next milestone. Otherwise, I don't get any more money. And I've got me £5,000 dripped in. And then to lift my spirits, a friend from America said, I hear you doing a wetsuit brand. And I, I know you'll pull it off. So here's a $200,000 order. Blimey. So with some orders from the UK, a shop doesn't exist anymore, Total Fitness in Nottingham. Had a lot of faith in me and a, a shop in Manchester Royals. I hit that landmark of 300000 So it's like, right, they can help fund that now. But I had to go and get validation of the product. So Olympic Games of 2012 in London. And the so, brand, what year was this? Was 2011. 2011. So, I thought, right, I, there's one. I got the orders in. Check two is getting Olympian wearing it. Well, there, there was two Olympians, Alistair and Johnny Brownlee, who were who were signed up with other wetsuit brands, and I'd done the deal for one of them. So, I thought, well, I can't get near that. But they needed a pilot for the game, somebody who was going to swim like a fish, bite like a demon, and then it didn't really matter what happened. But they were just going to lead Alistair and Johnny to get them to the run safely. And there was two athletes in line for it. So, I went and sponsored both of them. So I went back to the investors. I said, look, I can't guarantee which one it's going to be, but I've got both. So three athletes going to represent Great Britain. Two I can't have, but one I can have. Great tick. And it turned out that none of those two went to the Olympics. They picked a complete outsider, but I'd done my bit at the time. And then um, prove it was the fastest. We went to the Netherlands with Professor Hoob and we went to Eindhoven. And there was something called the MAD system, which is the measurement of active drag, which is a wind tunnel for water, if you like. And swimmers swim along a 25 metre long, almost a ladder, and it measures their force and frequency and gives you a, 
a, a data point. Just the thing they Correct. touch within in the pool yes. as they're swimming along. And that had one force plate on it. That cost me 5,000 euros every time I went. So I went, met Professor Hoob there, did some testing. Yeah, your suit's faster. Your women's is definitely faster because there's less buoyancy and they're engaging with the water better. So I got that data uh, and that was it. Tick, tick, tick. So the investors said, right, we'll give you £100,000 now to buy the stock. So I, friends got a little warehouse. I put my first delivery in there and I delivered my first wetsuit to my first customer. I delivered it to him in Hyde Park on 1st of May 2012. So we'd gone from October to May, China sourcing on boats, flying some stock in to the first sale. And from that first sale till September, which is my first financial year, we did half a million quid. It just... From nothing to half a million quid. Yeah, from nothing. You know, I, I, I was a bit like Dennis Waterman. I wrote the theme tune, you know, sang the theme tune. So I designed the product, marketed the product, sold the product from my kitchen table. And after the first few sales, I invested £4,000 in converting a bit of my garage to an office. Just had knocked down for an extension. I was gutted. But you, you got that foothold in the market. That was the important thing. What, what would you say was the most important thing? Having triathletes, international triathletes, looking at your suit. So... You got. I mean, you said you couldn't get the Brownlee brothers, but you had some pilots. So, how did how did you go from that to getting it visible? Is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, I mean, good question. I'm a huge, huge believer in taking punts. And there was two brothers who were world champions, uh, the Raylark brothers from Germany. And I just packaged up two wetsuits and sent them to them. Please try these. A little bit naive because you know the sponsorship deals around and all that. And uh, th- this was 2012, April the first. And there was a triathlon being streamed from the States. And it was being streamed. It was one of the early streamed live events because Lance Armstrong was competing in triathlon after finishing his cycling career. This was when everyone thought it was kind of clean. And at the swim, the camera's zooming in at the first swimmer coming along. And I'm seeing this red flash. And I've got a, a red technical piece on my wetsuits on the bicep. And I'm sat there in the, ki- in, in the middle room, the wife's in the kitchen, I'm seeing this little red flash. And Michael Raylock got out of the water first in my wetsuit. And I'm crying. Um, I, my wife said, are you all right? I go, yeah, I'm fine, I'm fine, fine. It was. It gets me now thinking about it. And straight away, my phone's going. Was that you? Was that your suit? What was it? What was he wearing? I got a message back from Lance Armstrong's management. He wants to wear your suit. Can you make him one with yellow inserts for Livestrong? I'm like, yeah, absolutely. And I, I made the suit and I put it on social media. Here's this, guess who this suit's for? Yeah. Three months after, I think it was, he, he got done done for, and for cheating and all that stuff. But uh, Michael Raylock coming out the water first was a massive moment. And that was a pure punt that I just sent them the suits. And I, I got as many athletes as I could. And I put suits on their back. There's a young girl who did the Olympics in London called Flora Duffy, an up and coming talent from Bermuda. I gave her a suit and she wasn't anywhere in the swim in London, but she it was a suit coming out the water. She went on to become triathlon world champion and big money took her elsewhere. But yeah, it was it was just taking all these little punts and going around to clubs, knocking on the door, doing training nights, doing swim nights with them and just getting people to hold it, scratch it and sniff it. So they'd seen it and then they turned TV on and might see it again. And it was just that barrage from all angles and doing it as cheap as I could because I didn't have a lot of money. But this is me listening to this is making me think because you started this at a slightly older age, more experience, it's using that experience that you had from your previous career and knowing where to push. Yeah, it is. I totally, you know, it, it, there will be nuggets of advice that may come from this or may not. But I'm, I'm a, a huge, huge believer in don't just run at it because you like it. Know it, understand it and get under the skin of it. You know, we can all go and say I want to open a pub, but we don't know probably too much about beer and logistics and licensing and food and hygiene and, and all those bits that go with it. But yeah, we'd all like to open a pub. I wanted to get into wetsuit world. I'd worked for three other brands. I knew the sport pretty well. And I knew what buttons to press and say and push and where to go. Yeah, big time. Now, we've talked a little bit about beyond wetsuits and you've branched out at times, haven't you? You've you've gone into events management. You've been yeah. with Jensen Button, bring his triathlon to Derby. Are there, is there anything else you've branched out into? No, I, I, I think I learned a lesson from that, though, as well. That um, just by talking to Jensen, he rang me up one day and just said, can I have some wetsuits? And I said, I can't afford you to wear that because I know how expensive Jensen Button is he said no it's outside of formula one it's just send me look after me and my mates and it's all good so a wonderful opportunity and got to know jensen his team he had a triathlon in luton i said you need to bring that to derby and uh what convinced me so you know other counties want it and cities so i wrote a proposal on derby was the finest city i wanted to you know 
go and sell bits of Derby off after I'd written this proposal to him. And uh, he said, yeah, let's do it. But then I didn't, ha- I, I had no way of putting an event on. I kind of knew a little bit. So we set Hoob events up really to put on the Jensen Button Triathlon and bring that to Derby and say, thank you, Derby, for your support. And a loan from the Enterprise Growth Fund in the early days, it was incredibly helpful to us. So this was like saying, well, you know, let's put something back. Jensen came, Gordon Ramsay came. It was an outstanding event. We had Bailey Matthews there with a, a kids triathlon. It didn't really make any money, but it put something fantastic on. But what I learned from it, and it was more my FD spotted it than me. He said, it's, it's, it's taking your attention away. Yeah, You need to be focused on what we're good at, which is wetsuits and tri suits and go in that triathlon market. So it, it was there and it worked. But in the end, I, we just kind of let it go and handed over the races to another race organiser. This is what somebody said to me. They said, Dean is, is very good at having a look at ideas. And then if it's not working for him, he will come back and, and focus on what's important. Yeah. Yeah. And it's hard because when you build something, you think I want to keep hold of it, hold of it, hold of it. But you have to just say, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let that go and, and move on. And I, I had aspirations to move into into cricket and, and look at that sport because I, if we can improve triathletes' performance and cyclist performance, who's this, so you can't take any sport to bits and pieces and, and, and put the pieces back better and lighter and stronger and more efficient. So yeah, paid around with all kinds of ideas, <laughs> but you've got to come back to where you, what you're good at and what you know. But you have diverse, diversified to a degree. There's there's cycling wear, yeah. general training wear, casual clothing, jackets, stuff like that. Yeah, I've try to fill the triathletes wardrobe triathletes are very proud to be what they are which are immense athletes very committed very focused and they kind of want to wear a badge of honor of triathlon so i wanted to fill the wardrobe with the training wear and the competition wear and we moved into the soft goods you know the nice casual items they're never going to be big number sellers for us but it just keeps that triathlete connection because they're proud of wearing hoob wetsuits they think it'd be nice just to have a little bit of a hoob it really is it's kind of that work rest and play thing you know if you're into motocross you're going to wear as many brands that reflect motocross as possible so your peers in that sport recognize you're into motocross runners do it you know they'll they'll wear brands that typically aren't high street you know be an asics be an on or a hoka or something and you can look at someone and go yeah you're a runner and it's that community and it's that tribal piece that I wanted to be part of. So it's never going to move the needle massively. It's always going to be a burden of stock, but we're at the heart of it. Uh, we tried to do it for women. It was more difficult because there's so many brands competing for that. Right. And we, we kind of said, well, let's let's stay in the space, but pull back a little bit. We did arrange with Gordon Ramsay's wife, the Tana collection, and it did okay, but I wish it could have done better. But without scale, you don't get the better pricing from the factories. And without the better pricing, you're limited to your sales channels, blah, 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 blah. Is there anything else you're going into? What's next for Hoob in that sense? Well, it's cycling now and, you know, we're going to, we're going to hit limits on wetsuits and rubber and, and, and around the world. We've still got some big territories to go out on wetsuits and triathlon, Germany and the US uh, especially. But cycling is, it, you could say it's overcrowded, but I kind of quite like that because there's a lot of overcrowding of me too. And I want to go into cycling with an aerodynamic benefit. So the, the fastest suit for cycling on the track in the world at the moment we make the fastest team for pursuit in the world or one of the top three, we make their suits. And that's the guys from Derby, the Who Bought Bike team. And I've gone right at the very top of the pyramid so my technology can filter down. And it'll not only filter down the cycling pyramid, it'll bleed into the triathlon pyramid. So now when I talk about aerodynamics in my triathlon suits, I've got credibility behind it. I've got testing with Dan Biggin from the Who Bought Bike team at the amazing Derby Arena where we do our testing. And then we've got wind tunnel facilities where we go as well. So we, we, we can package it all up and what we learn in one field will benefit in the other. So cycling is a push for us. Investment is needed in that. The team that we have came to me initially for some clothing and then I said, I'll give you a bit of money. And then we're doing their suits and each suit they wear, if you retailed it, would be £5,000. And then they go, well, I need... Oh, we've just become national champions. We need two suits. Oh, dear my, I did. But it gives us that credibility. But do you have suits for retail that aren't £5,000? Yeah, we do. Yeah, and £300 will get you a very fast cycling suit that you can step onto the track and know you've got a competitive advantage. Whilst the rules allow it, they're constantly changing the rules. Cycling seems to hate innovation. You know, they did it with Graham O'Brien and Chris Boardman, and they're now doing it with the Who Bought Bike team and our cyclists and, and the clothing that we're producing. You said previously you didn't like the word entrepreneur. Nah. But that's what you are. You get stuff done because that's what an entrepreneur does. Yeah. I, I, th- I think it's because I, I'll open up LinkedIn and there's lots of people calling themselves entrepreneurs. And I, I sometimes wonder if you've, you've earned the stripes and sweated enough to call yourself an entrepreneur. 
I can't call myself a doctor. You know, maybe I could say I'm doctor of triathlon. I don't have the qualifications and I haven't done it. I haven't been to the university and done the master's, PhDs or whatever you need to become a doctor. And I, I just think it's a term that is, is, is maybe used by people who maybe aren't quite sure. I'm an entrepreneur. Have you really put your house on the line? Have you really sweated it? Have you lost properties? Have you lost businesses? Have you been knocked down and got up again? So I, I prefer the term hurdler because you, you start off on the B of the bang with great gusto and you hurdle and then you'll have another one and you might knock a couple down and you may fall down yourself, but you're going to get up and you're going to run again and you're running at speed and this hurdle's coming towards you. I just got to bloody get over it and you've got to hurdle it. And we're hurdlers on a never ending track because you never have a 300 meters or there's always something. They may become less important than what they were or they may be even bigger and more important than what they were. But there's always something you've got to get over. So, yeah, I, I don't like the word entrepreneur. I, I'd, I'd rather say I'm a hurdler. <laughs> My next question was going to be, what are the in- essential skills of, for an entrepreneur? But I suppose we should say, what are the essential skills for a hurdler then? Yeah, so the essential skills for a hurdler, I think you could be a 100-meter runner or an 800-meter runner on a track. I think I've just got to worry about running tactically in, in a straight line or around the bend or just run my own race and have my tunnel vision. I think when you're a, a hurdling entrepreneur, you've got to be a bit stupid and you've almost got to ignore good advice or what people tell you because you've just got to run at it and think, I'm going to shut my eyes and lift my legs and try and get over it and get on with it. Because and once you've done it a few times, you'll keep doing it and doing it and doing it. But, but with the benefit of the experience that you talked about before, sort of having that within your mind when you're throwing yourself over that hurdle. Yeah, yeah. I've done, I've done it before. And I know if I lift my knee high enough, I can do this. And I can get over it and I kind of know what the next one might be. Or I know that in four strides, I've got to do it again. And four strides, I've got to do it again. You're right. It, it teaches you the space between the hurdles. And if, and if you don't make it over that hurdle, think about why you didn't make it over that hurdle. Yeah. Analyze it. But there's another, another one coming. So learn quickly from that one because there's another one on its way. Yeah, it, yeah, definitely. The experience counts huge, huge amounts. And, and again, maybe that goes back to my distaste of the entrepreneur. You know, hey, you're 23 years old. Yeah, I'm an entrepreneur. Yeah, we in this day and age of social media, you know, there are some amazing entrepreneurs that are doing stuff, you know, with videos and that, that my son shows me and bewilders me, but they're great. They're building incredible businesses from it. But I just think it's used without that wealth of, of experience that can change the outcome. You know, I've had business, I had a business before and, and it collapsed. It was, a, it was a running shop in Nottingham. I had one in Derby that I grew and built and that's still going today and I'm no part of it. But I went to do it again when I had many other businesses and I had too much going on and I had to close one down. Uh, but what I learned from that, you just get up and go again. So uh, yeah, it's back to that experience. Now, one of the reasons we're doing this podcast at the moment is about entrepreneurship and why it's important to the UK economy. What's so vital about hurdling entrepreneurship to the economy in general? Well, I think we're, we're the entry level of, of employment you know, when we're growing, once we get moving, we're taking on staff at a great rate and we're, we're unlikely to be hemorrhaging those staff. It's going to be a growth until we get to, I don't know, there'll be some stats somewhere that says once you get 30, you, you might bleed up or down depending on what your turnover is. I can have a bad year and I'll still be needing more staff. We, you know, we're going to keep growing that, you know, with taxpayers. We're not big enough to domicile at different points around the world so we don't pay tax. You know, there are lots of things that we can benefit to offset some of that tax. But because we're small businesses, we're probably not savvy on that. You know, we're quite good. We know about R&D tax credits and we know about patent box and we've been as smart as we can, you know, on the tax that we're paying. But I think a lot of small businesses, you know, they'll get up, they're making profit and they're reinvesting again. They're reinvesting people. And it's also the fresh ideas for the future. We've got, you know, got some big companies in this city, Rolls Royce and Toyota they're there and they're surviving off local smaller businesses, be it from engineering or supply chain, feeding into that. And, I, you know, I don't know too much about it, but I bet they're not businesses they've set up. It's small entrepreneurial attitudes of people who probably used to work there or used to work in other sectors of engineering saying, well, I'm going to set up my own little shop and we're going to supply that beast that's on our doorstep. And I think that's what's quite exciting about about Darby. You know, I grew up with get your job at Rolls-Royce and, and it's safe. It's nice to say, well, go and work at Qualcast or, or Rail, Combustion and, and all, Selenese and all that and, and get on the pathway and stay with the company for many years. And it was almost as though Derby was anti-entrepreneurial because it, it was these pathways were kind of set. But now the mentality I, I, I kind of see is let, let's feed these big companies and set up our own little workshops or advice companies or, you know, whatever it may be that's going to add value. So is it that the larger companies 
aren't using entre- entrepreneurial spirit when they're thinking of new ideas and how to develop because you know you're you're still a growing company but as a company gets bigger do they lose that i think they must do i i have this analogy and visual in my head of i'm a little speedboat of being annoying as hell in, in a, a port of oil tankers and i'll zip around and i'll move around really quickly and these tankers take so long to move that you know the tides change by the time they've moved and that's how I look at it with, with business and maybe some, some of the big businesses. It's such a slow shift for anything to happen. And I think one of the hard things to do is to keep your culture lightweight, nimble and flexible. You know, my FD is, you know, what project are you on now? And he'll struggle to keep up with me and I have to keep informed the best I can just because it, it's where I, what opportunity I see next and I'm chasing. In the bigger companies, you know, th- there'll be so many layers and there's a lot of ass covering, isn't there? You know, we CC the whole world on an email to ass cover ourselves. Well, I sent an email. Well, that doesn't mean nothing or anyone's read it. But I think we have a bit of that society as well. And I, I you know, the, the bigger corporations, you'd like to think that they're they're breeding the entrepreneurial spirit. I went, I went down to Deloitte and one of my investors is a, is a senior partner there and he works in the incubation unit and they're just bringing out new ideas out of this unit all the time. That must be, um, imagine how exciting that would be. But that's in a major company. Yeah. So so there is space for that. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You, you need those kind of rooms or spaces or the crazy ones where, you know, you're a little bit off the wall. You perhaps argue with your manager too much because you've got another idea. So you go and play in that playpen over there where you can do what you want and it's a bit of a budget. That must be fantastic. And I've seen it and you read about it in books and, and other companies that do it. But I wonder how much of it really goes on. You'd like to think it goes on everywhere. But I think the true entrepreneurial spirit only comes out when you've got to pay bills. You've got to have a point of difference. And you're competing against lots of others in that field. And you've, you've just got to go at it with a very different angle and a very different approach. But is there anything you can teach these larger businesses from where you are? Yeah, I mean, I, I was invited to Rolls-Royce to go and give a talk to one of their like specialist engineering departments. And I focused on um, what a two-year-old would do. So my grandson, Jackson, he's not Jackson Jackson. <laughs> he's, a, he's got a different surname. Uh, so Jackson... Um, if he'd look at a, a 12 kilogram dumbbell and we'd have just done, you know, kettlebell training and he'd go and try and pick it up. Now, if you or I looked at a hundred kilogram dumbbell, which would probably be in relation to our weights versus that, you just look at it and go, I ain't picking that up. But he'd go up and pick it up because he think, well, I'm just going to try this. It might work. I don't know. He got no preconceptions about it. So he went and tried it. And it was the same with me for the Olympic Games. I wanted my logo coming out the water first at the Rio Olympic Games. Now, I wasn't a sponsor of any big federation. I wasn't, a, you know, a, a Visa Coca-Cola. So how was I going to do that? So we looked into the rules of the Olympic Games for kit supply. And if you supply a nation with a technical piece of kit, you're allowed a logo up to 30 centimetres squared, which is ridiculously big. No one else had picked up on this. So I sponsored the Slovakian Triathlon Federation, two members of that team. I said, I'm your kit supplier for the Olympics. I went, oh yeah, rock on, you know, big deal, this one. And I sponsored a guy called Richard Varga, fastest swimmer in triathlon. But we read the small print, produced him a suit, put a big 30 centimetre squared logo on the front. He was in Rio and he went to kit check in and they said, your logo is far too big, son, go and get it um, blanked out. So he toddled off, got it blanked out, came back the next day and they went, no, you were right, Richard. We've checked the rules and your logo was big enough. And he went, it's a good job I got a spare one then, isn't it? And he pulled his spare suit out and he was first out of the water at the Olympic Games. And you've got the triathlon first out, big hoob logo. And we showed it actually in the quad cinema. We had it on live. I, that was another teary moment. And that was just by looking at the rules and not taking them for granted and like going, well, let's let's start again. And let's just reread that and see what it really says and go, well, Again, are we the stupid ones? Because I don't think they quite get this. But that's looking at the hurdles and going, let's do our research again. You know, how do we get over the hurdle? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and what's the most efficient way to get over that hurdle? Or is there a cheat? You know, how, how can we do that? Now then, we're getting towards the end. So what advice would you give somebody who's considering setting out on their own, whether they're a 23-year-old or a 40-year-old? What advice would you give them? I'd probably give two, really. Um, one, as I touched on earlier, is know the space you're going into and know it intimately and know every single nuance of it and inside and out because you're going to need an armory of weapons when it comes to getting exposure for your product, researching your product, when the market's going to buy it, what prices, what the margins are, the supply chain for it. You're going to need so much. It isn't a case of I'm going to launch a wetsuit next Friday. It just does not happen. Know whatever you're going to do incredibly well. Research it. 
But at the same time, ignore everybody because th- those that say you can't do it are the ones that are scared to do it. And if you're prepared to do it, ignore them because if they were that smart and that good, they'd have done it. So the fact they're telling you not, I think is a lot of people's inner fear that they just don't do it themselves. So crack on with it and give it a go and learn from some of those mistakes. So that's the thing, learning from mistakes, isn't it? It's yeah. it's taking on that hurdle. Maybe that's the difference between a smaller company that's growing and a larger company. They've made lots of mistakes and the fear of, because you've got so much investment in other things, whether you actually want to go further. Yeah, if you're, if you're you know, for a large company to make a small mistake could be hugely detrimental. So is there support out there for budding entrepreneurs? Yeah, there is. I mean, I think we're very lucky in Derby. You know, we've had, as I mentioned, the Enterprise Growth Fund that was very supportive of us and, and they gave us a grant to take on seven members of staff before we could afford seven members of staff so I could gear up and, and and be ready for the growth of the business that was a massive support Derby is a village you know we are the city but it's like a business village and it's thanks to members of the university bringing partners together marketing Derby is an incredible tool if you're looking to set a business up in this city, pay your 500 quid to Marketing Derby. It'll be the best 500 pound you'll ever spend. You not only get lots of free coffees and bacon rolls at several locations, but you'll get to meet other business owners and network and share stories and support. And that, that's that's invaluable. That's been a huge, huge assistance to me. Now, we've talked about you bringing events to Derby, um, but you're involved in promoting the city in other ways. I mean, we talked about Marketing Derby. So you, you and coming to the university and going to other places. So you're big at promoting the city. I mean, you're doing it right now, in fact. Yeah, it's. Um, I'm a bit fed up of traveling the world and people go, where's Derby? And you have to go, it's next to Nottingham. I want people to go, oh yeah, Derby. Yeah, Nottingham's next door to there, isn't it? I think, you know, I, I'm Derby through and through. I lived in the States for two years and worked for another triathlon company. And we could have moved for my next role anywhere in the world. They said, wherever you want to go, we'll transport you there. We'll help you get set up and go anywhere in the world. And so we just want to go back to Derby. And I think it's that, like I touched on that village feel and I'm, I'm proud of it. If we can bring star names to the city and triathlons, I'm part of a, a group of businesses that have helped bring the Darley Park concert back to Darley. Uh, Michael Brain from Hannels led that charge. You know, we can all chip a bit in and make it happen. Now that event should be sustainable for years to come. So we are a small, very small business in this city, but the collective can really make stuff happen. I'm just... Yeah, I'm just very proud of it. And, you know, we're, we're, we're kind of the underdog at times, especially with the city next door, but we put up a damn good fight. Dean, what do you consider to be your greatest achievement with Hoob? Oh, do I just have one? Um, I've got two, really. I, I think for me, it was when we put our sign up on this building, which is a beautiful building on Full Street, a huge amount of history. And I, I came and stood outside when we did that and had a very teary moment. Just, you know, this Olveston lad who ain't the brightest has managed to achieve this, which for me was, which was a wonderful thing. It serves a living for a a small, incredibly productive, fantastic team. That was a proud moment for me. And it's kind of putting your mark on the centre of the city of Derby. People kind of see it and they may be inquisitive as to what it is. And you say, well, I kind of, I did that. Uh, But I think the main one for me is is the fact my family are proud of me. It makes me immensely proud. And when my wife's proud of what I've achieved and, and when they talk about it with, you know, with excitement and enthusiasm. So, yeah, I, I think it's that really. It's, it's making others proud kind of does it for me. And what's your favourite product? I mean, I've been looking through your inventory. There's a there's a swim float for people with heavy legs, which I think is a lovely <laughs> idea. Yeah, yeah um, and it's called the Big Boy. <laughs> and the slightly smaller version for women is called the Toy Boy. My, my favourite product, I think, is our black T-shirt because I obsess over T-shirts. And we found a lovely T-shirt supplier and it fits great and it's comfortable to wear. So, yeah, there's lots of science and aerodynamics going on, but I just really love my black T-shirt. That we you weren't wear. wearing a black T-shirt now. Yeah, it's not. It's, it's a hoop prototype one that hasn't got hoop on it. I'm testing the fit and shape. The problem is I keep changing with shape and holidays and things and going, this T-shirt's now a bit tight, change the cut. One thing I wanted to ask you, you keep saying I'm not the brightest and you keep... Yeah, I probably need to work on that. Yeah, you do. <laughs> I think for somebody who's achieved what you've achieved, I think maybe it's not not what you think it is. It's that imposter syndrome, isn't it? You know, I'm I'm here and uh, and I I am not you know the, the one with the degree and the engineering degree, but here we are. Yeah, I mean I'm dyspraxic as well. I think that's probably didn't help me through school, but I think that's allowed me to look at things a bit differently. So I think you're right. I think I have skills that I don't recognise, but I have uh, you know uh, inabilities that I do. 
And uh, I did have some help with that, getting over that. Yeah, and I think maybe it's probably a good thing to keep a bit of that humbleness as well, that actually I need to really prove that this is a damn good idea and that this will work. Well, it seems to be working. Yeah, it does. We, you know, we, we, we'll hit those turnover numbers and we're profitable and we've got companies interested in buying us and we've rebuffed them and said no. Oh, back. really? Yeah, we, we went through a round uh, last year, but we've had great support from the bank. So we said, no, we'll work with you. It doesn't hurt my shareholding by working with the bank. It grew it. Uh, so yeah, we'll see what next five years, we may look at it very differently. But yeah, it's, it's we've got a wonderful brand and a wonderful city producing amazing products with the best ambassadors in the world. So yeah, Mondays are great. Mondays are brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> now, as we draw to a close, this is the big question. What's the single most important piece of advice you can give our podcast listeners? Believe in yourself. And if someone says no, ask them why. And it's that old, was it five whys? And you'll get to the bottom of the problem. Yeah. If they say no, don't take it as a no. Take it as a, I've got to go and understand why there's a no. Because if I'd have said to somebody, I'm going to be first out of the water at the Olympic Games with my logo in a size that would shock everybody, can I do it? They'd say no, but there is a way to do it. So yeah, believe in yourself and take no as a, a an amber, not a red. Excellent. Now then, we're sitting in your office in the Hoob Bike Works building in Full Street in Derby, Yep, where people can come along and find out about you and see your products here. Yep. Yeah, we have a, a showroom downstairs. It isn't merchandise like the sexiest shop in the world, which I would like because it, it's, a, it's a working unit and we take stock in and out and to expos and shows. But yeah, we, we welcome people to come in because there's no finer way to buy a wetsuit than actually put it on, get fitted properly and understand it is a tight garment. It does feel a bit restrictive. It's a bit claustrophobic and we can talk you through the experience rather than just, you know, yeah, online sales are great, but we much rather people come in and have a good fitting experience with us. And talking of online, you've got a website. Yep, hoopdesign.com. Doing very well and growing. And we, we just had a shift of resources to, you know, move our advertising. The ROIs we're getting, you know, through the SEO and through our social media. You're using lots of acronyms now. I know, it scares me. When you're 40 odd and they start using all these acronyms, it's like, what does that one mean? But you're on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. Yeah, yeah we're, on, we're on all of those. So how can people find you? If you go uh, just Hoop Design on on twitter and instagram and well instagram's actually hoob and facebook soup design excellent well it's been a marvelous afternoon cool yeah uh, you know you can tell i like talking so thanks for asking me great questions <laughs> <laughs> well thank you to dean jackson from hoob for joining our podcast thanks thank very you, much Toby. Well, we've heard from Dean and he's told us about his journey with Hoob that started with an idea for a niche product and developed into a successful business. I've been joined again by my co-host Angela Tooley, who is our resident business expert. So Angela, we talked earlier on about taking a punt. Um, Dean had some extremely interesting stories about how he did that. Oh, yes. And you can't deny that there was an incredible amount of luck involved as well in the fact that he started his business in 2011, the year before London 2012. And he is actually entering what is a very niche, but also a hugely growing market in terms of triathletes, in particular amateur triathletes. I would like to think that, yes, he took a punt, but I would describe it more as calculated risks. And I think Dean is incredibly good at doing the research before he actually took those punts. So yes, Dean had spent most of his career working in the performance sportswear industry. So he had a deep knowledge of the business. He had a deep knowledge, oh. but he didn't take that for granted. Uh, and at the very start, he went out and he did the research. He looked at what his competitors were doing. He looked at what was happening in the market in terms of material development. He spent a lot of time talking to customers. Yeah. And he really got under the skin to understand who his customers were and what his customers would want. Because he said, surely somebody's done this already. Surely somebody's come up with this idea, this idea of creating a wetsuit that is performance based, that is designed to increase the performance of the athlete. Yes, he did. And I'm sure many people at that point would have just walked away from the idea. But he went and he looked and he investigated and he researched that and he found out that actually this was something that was new to the industry at the time. I think he said that the industry is more focused around look and style than it was around what he was trying to do, which was something that was more focused around performance and speed and 
that was something that, that resonated very strongly with his potential customers. So when he did take what I would call the punts, he was backing that up with his own knowledge of, of the industry and his own research into it. When he went out to Professor Hoop Toussaint and had already trademarked the name, when he sent wetsuits to various athletes because he thought if they did wear them and they did wear them, it would be really good exposure for him. Yeah, exactly. He, I think he very early on in developing the Who brand, he developed a concept of a brand that was very closely associated with speed and performance. And actually that, in terms of a, a brand value, was really the starting point of building a successful business. And that was validated by Professor Hoob and the research that they did and the testing that they did on the fabrics together. So actually Hoob as a name and the wetsuits as a product are validated by that world-class research and testing. But they're also validated by the customers in terms of having Hoob suits that are first out of the pool on the first leg of a triathlon. It was not only validated by those professional athletes, but it was also validated by what I would class the mass market, those amateur athletes who buy into the science, buy into what they see in terms of who brands being first out of the pool on the television and actually wanting to buy that. He spent a lot of time talking to customers and potential customers and really understanding their needs and getting under the psyche of a typical triathlete who would wear his suit. And actually, that's that's a really important thing to do. And there's a term that, that is increasingly being used to describe this, which is about customer-centric innovation, which essentially is about making sure that what you are creating addresses the needs of your customers. Too much research, too much innovation happens in a silo. So actually, you create something that's absolutely fantastic but there isn't a necessarily a market for what you're doing. So that relates beyond the idea of performance athletic wear. In any business, you need to know what your customers want. There's no point producing a, a product that your customers don't want. Absolutely. It's not about making sure that your customer wants to buy your product and needs your product, but it's also understanding some of those other nuances, like understanding what they're prepared to pay for it. So they might say this is absolutely great, but they might not pay £100 for it. They might only pay £50 for it. So you can then use that to start developing the product characteristics. Dean's in a market that is very niche, where he absolutely understood that his customers valued the science base that he built the brand around. And actually, that was one of the reasons why they were buying his wetsuits, because of that that science-based innovation that had been validated. But you don't necessarily always have to do that. So not every design has to be gold-plated. It's about understanding what those characteristics are and meeting, meeting those customer needs and making sure that they're balanced. Dean made some very interesting points about entrepreneurship. He doesn't like to use the word entrepreneur. He likes to use the word hurdler in the sense that every challenge is a hurdle. You either leap over it without a scratch or you hit it and learn from why you hit it and then get up and ready for the next one, which is coming up fast. He also made some interesting points about how those entrepreneur ideas can be used within big business. Do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, I, I like his hurdling. I think it's a great analogy on, on life in general and the fact that inevitably we all hit hurdles and it's about how you deal with those as to how you move on and, and how successful you can be in the future and how much you learn from those. So I think that's an absolutely valid point to make. With regard to his thoughts about how entrepreneurship and how entrepreneurs can help big businesses, I think he's absolutely correct. As businesses grow, they tend to lose some of that ability to be flexible and dynamic and they lose some of that creativity that is so important for, for innovation. And that's that's just the nature of how things develop and the fact that as businesses grow, there's more people in there. With more people, you have to start putting more structure and 
more bureaucracy and processes is in there. And quite often as businesses grow, they become more risk averse. I guess they have more to lose and there's more at stake when you're employing 50, 100 people than when it's just you on your own in your kitchen. But is there something that within those circumstances you think larger businesses could do within that idea of entrepreneurship? Yes, quite definitely. And I encourage anyone who works in a large business to pick up the phone and go and see what others are doing and see what are the smaller businesses and how they're working and the environment that their people sit in at some point. So, for example, for example, there's some really quite simple things that you can do just to start building that creative environment within a larger business. So if you compare a typical office in a large business compared with a, a perhaps a high tech small business, you associate large businesses with white ward offices, lots of lines of desks, people almost sort of sitting in windowless rooms, you know, and working in that sort of environment. If you go and see many of the businesses that I go and see are smaller businesses who are perhaps more creative, sort of technology focused. They're perhaps more open plan offices. Just even things like their colour schemes are very different. You just get a different sort of feel. They quite often have big social areas. I went to a, a company the other week and they got a a hangout area that they called the cave and there was comfy furniture and a TV and it was um it it was just an environment just to allow people just to sit and reflect and be creative without the computer in front of them or the phones ringing or things like that and it, sometimes you just by implementing those sorts of environments you can just help stimulate that many companies now are introducing ideas boards ideas competitions where you can submit ideas that you've had throughout the year and they will get looked at and assessed and some of them that they think are really good will get taken forwards. Um, so there's lots of different things that larger businesses can start to do just to develop that in mind. But I think the important thing is not about stimulating lots of ideas because I think by nature people have ideas. It's about what you do with those ideas. And one thing that perhaps larger businesses aren't very good at is working with individuals to take those ideas forwards and assess those ideas. In Dean's case, if he's got an idea that he wants to work with, then he can very quickly pick up the phone, talk to a potential manufacturer. He can go out and and he can do something with it very quickly. He doesn't need to wade through lots of gated processes he doesn't need to get permission from anyone and he, he he can do that and he can very quickly take something to market. So that's his speedboats and oil tankers. It takes a long time for a big business to actually turn towards an idea. Absolutely. And we're in an age now where businesses need to learn to be more agile and flexible in the ever-changing environment that we're in. The most successful businesses will have that ability Uh, and culture to enable them to take opportunities as and when they arise. Dean's big giveaway, let's say, was don't take no for an answer. Well, take no for an answer, but understand why it's a no. Is that what your big takeaway would be from from what Dean's been talking about? I think that was a, a really valid point that he made. Dean spoke about being like a two-year-old again and two-year-olds ask why all the time. But actually, don't be afraid to ask why. What we need to encourage is those open conversations rather than close conversations. So your idea in its pure form may not be possible, but actually an adaptation of it may be. So by asking why, you can start to tease those things out and start to understand the underlying issues. You can start to develop solutions for those challenges and for those issues that have arisen. Thank you very much, Angela. Next time, we'll be joined by Trevor Williams, former chief economist at Lloyds Bank and a visiting professor at the University of Derby. You've been listening to Inspired Business, a podcast from the University of Derby telling amazing and inspirational stories from businesses in Derby, Derbyshire and beyond. Please subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts. Leave us a rating or review and tell a friend who might also like to listen. Also, if you'd like to be a guest on a future episode of the show, please get in touch. 
You can find contact details and more information about the series at derby.ac.uk forward slash inspired business. Thanks so much for listening. We'll catch up with you again very soon.